afternoon, good evening, depending on the time zone from which you are joining us. I'm Jujana Magdo, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's panel in my dual role as Associate Director for the University of Pittsburgh Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, and as Chair of the Committee for the Advocacy of Diversity and Inclusion at the Association for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Before we start, I'd like to thank our colleagues, Chris Martin and Laura Sargent at Harvard University's Davis Center for co-organizing and hosting this series with us. Allow me to also convey our gratitude to all institutional sponsors, including the association and our peer regional studies centers at the University of California, Berkeley, University of Chicago, Kansas, Michigan, Texas at Austin, Wisconsin, Madison, as well as Columbia University, Indiana University, Bloomington, Ohio State University, and UNC Chapel Hill. Today's topic is Discourse and Decolonization, Perspectives from Outside the Anglophone Academy. Our moderator, Vitaly Chernetsky, is prof professor of Slavic languages and literatures at the University of Kansas, and president-elect of the Association for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Professor Czarnecki's profile as an educator and researcher combines comprehensive and wide-ranging work on Ukrainian, Russian, and other Slavic literatures and cultures with a variety of cross-disciplinary engagements, most notably with film, gender, and LGBTQ plus studies, Jewish studies, translation studies, and diaspora migration studies. He has consistently sought to bring Ukraine and the broader East European Eurasian region and its cultural riches to the forefront of global attention. Among his many publications, he is the author of Mapping Post-Communist Cultures, Russia and Ukraine in the Context of Globalization, which was published by McGill Queens University Press in 2007. This book is also a co-winner of the book prize from the American Association for Ukrainian Studies and a winner of best Ukrainian book in the humanities at Ukraine's book of, year, book of the year awards. For brevity's sake, let me just mention that he's also the author of numerous articles that present modern and contemporary Russian and Ukrainian culture in cross-regional and cross-disciplinary contexts. Vitaly, thank you for shepherding today's conversation. Before I hand the session over to our moderator, a bit of housekeeping, we kindly ask members of the audience to please use uh, Zoom's Q&A function to post questions. If you happen to be following us on YouTube, your questions posted there will also be shared with our moderator. Thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, dear friends, dear audience members uh, joining us, uh, welcome to uh, today's uh, panel in our Decolonization and Focus series. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to serve as moderator today. We have three uh, wonderful speakers, and uh, I will introduce them first. We have a slight change in order. and. Uh, each speaker will have time to present the initial remarks, and we hope to have a rich and robust discussion afterwards. So um, let me introduce our speakers today. Speaking first will be Katarzyna gurak Sosnowska, who is an associate professor at the Institute of International Studies, SGH Warsaw School of Economics, she completed her PhD in economics and habilitation in the study of religions. Her research interests focus on Muslim minorities in Poland and wider Europe. Her recent publications include two monographs, Managing Spoiled Identity, The Case of Polish Female Converts to Islam, where she's a co-author, and Non-Inclusive Education in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, where she's a co-editor as well as an article on racialization strategies towards Polish converts to Islam in the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies. In 2021, she was awarded uh, a grant by the European Commission to challenge the negative discourse about Islam in Poland. Since 2022, she's also involved in a digital Islam project that investigates European Islamic online environments and is funded within the European Union's Horizon 2020 program. 
Speaking second will be uh, Dr. Irina Sklokina, who is a historian researcher at the Center for Urban History in Lviv, Ukraine. At the center, she researches cultural heritage, in particular, industrial and Soviet heritage in Kharkiv and Lviv. She wrote her doctoral dissertation about the official Soviet policy of memory of the Nazi occupation of Ukraine using the example of the city of Kharkiv. Uh, Dr. Sklokina took part in several international projects about historical memory and oral history, including open heritage, organizing, promoting, uh, and enabling heritage reuse through inclusion, technology, access, governance, and empowerment. In 2019, 2021, she was leading a cooperative project on digitizing and reuse of audiovisual archives called un slash archiving post slash industry. Among her recent publications is a co-edited uh, volume with Guido Hausmann, uh, The Political Cult of the Dead in Ukraine, Traditions and Dimensions from the First World War to Today, and a co-edited special issue with Victoria Donovan, Donbass Imaginaries, Heritage, Culture, Communities. And speaking a third uh, will be Dr. Botakoska Sembekova, who is a lecturer assistant professor in modern history at the University of Basel with a specialization in Soviet history. Her first book, Despite Cultures, Early Soviet Rule in Tajikistan, published by Pittsburgh University Press in 2016, traces Soviet imperial strategies in Central Asia. Her current research project investigates post-Stalinist Soviet Union and analyzes how Soviet citizens unprocess Stalinism in their own lives. Another book project in co-authorship with Kimberly St. Julian Varnon of the University of Pennsylvania, titled Imperial Innocence, is a cultural history of Soviet settler colonialism under contract with Cambridge University Press. Uh, we are delighted that our three speakers are uh, joining us today. And uh, Katarzyna, you have the floor first. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as it's the case of Warsaw at the moment. Uh, I will start with sharing my positionality, which is a double positionality in this case. Uh, I feel like, in a way, a subject of Slavic studies. Uh, at the same time, I will try to tackle the issue of decolonization from Polish perspective. Uh, my double positionality will make me speak about Poland, not as from external perspective, but rather from insider perspective. So I will rather say we in Poland do something uh, not in Poland. It is in a way, I, I think it is. Uh, and as already mentioned, my field is Muslims in Poland in wider Europe. So I will definitely leave the Slavic studies to the other speakers. I will also leave the Soviet space to other speakers, so I will just start with uh, with the Polish perspective. So last week uh, I was listening to the discussion, and uh, Dr. Marina Mogilnia started the discussion with saying that decolonization is a buzzword uh, for uh, English speaking or global Western academia. I tried to follow this path, um, and uh, I did a very small Google query and found out that the same decolonization is, as you can see, absent from Polish academia. Uh, and this is how it starts. Uh, decolonization in Polish, Google Scholar gives you 75, eight hits. It's mostly, as you can see, about um, general ideas about colonialism, decolonization, post-colonialism. Uh, it might be about Western Sahara, it might be about Bolivia, it might be about uh, Myanmar, but not necessarily about Poland. Decolonization plus Poland, to make it maybe more real, it is still mostly about Africa, Canada, Burma, some articles about Poland, but still not that many. And then if you Google decolonization in English plus Poland, there is much more literature available. And as you can see, there are articles that tackle Poland in terms of decolonization. 
So there is Polish economists in Nehru, India, there is uh, this the, from decolonization to the Stalinization, decolonization of Poland, and so on and so on. So my first remark here would be that for some reason that I will try to explain later, if we communicate in English to the global academia, then we are able and we are happy to discuss Poland and Polish experiences in terms of decolonization. But if we communicate in Polish, for some reason, the, the, the perspective is absent. To make the picture uh, broader or wider, I took the effort to investigate for top four Polish universities, if they have or offer courses on decolonization or post-colonial studies, this is the result. So as you can see, it's either post-colonial literature in general, post-colonial studies in general, colonialism, decolonization, post-colonialism, or Africa, EU and post-colonial Soviet societies, quite an interesting perspective, Afro-Caribbean, British history. There are some courses at the end of the slide on uh, the Ukraine-Russia relations, so Caucasus, and I have found only one on uh, Polish culture in a post-colonial perspective. So this is the very starting point. Now, why is this the case, I was wondering? Uh, because technically, well, Poland used to be, as some people claim, a colonizer, and we also were colonized. So there is a great floor to, 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 to follow this path to use it. But then if you take a look at how do we approach being a colonizer towards, you know, people from Belarus, Ukraine, and so on, we don't use the vocabulary related to coloni colonizing. This perspective is absent. So we call this, you know, that this used to be Polish borderlands. We have a bit of nostalgia in there, but still not, we were not the colonizers. Frankly speaking, when I was younger, I firstly, uh, well, learned that we were colonizers from an English speaking reviewer when I was submitting a, a paper to an English speaking journal and claimed that Poland, unlike uh, Western Europe, never had any colonies. And then I was, you know, there was this, hey, come on, what about Ukraine? Take a look. So I googled and of course I encountered an article with, uh, written by a Western scholar and I was, I was surprised, I must, I must admit. Okay, so then we were also colonized, and this is the Russia, this is the Germany. Again, we talk about the partition of Poland, we talk about occupation of Poland, we talk about Russification, Germanification, but not colonization. And my reflection is, is it then proper or okay to, to, to discuss Polish experience in terms of colonization or decolonialization, if this perspective seems to be absent? This is just a question mark. And then there is another perspective. For some reason, when the post-colonial studies were developed, it was a dialogue between the first word and the third word. And Poland was in the second, in the middle way. So for maybe this is also the reason why we were absent. If you take a look, let's say, the classics, Edward Said, Orientalism. Third word accuses the first word. Second is missing. So, well, Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans too uh, developed their own Orientalisms. So we were nesting Orientalism, we had internal Orientalisms, we had frontier Orientalisms, but we still were not included. And even now, I mean, another tricky question, does Poland belong to the West? Or not necessarily. And some people say, yes, actually, you can fit in. Some people say, no, 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 no. Despite being in the EU, we, we are still in transition, we are still post-communist, we are still, well, looked as we, we are to, to, to catch up with the West, to catch up with the European Union. And the same struggle not only goes not only with the colonization, it goes also with other vocabulary or other concepts that are brought to us from outside, critical thinking. So if you take a look at critical thinking, either we uh, analyze how critical thinking is developed in the US, in the UK, or we claim that we don't need American Western style of critical thinking because we have our own pragmatic logic. This is the name. Intercultural education. 
Poland is a homogeneous, I mean, we used to be a homogeneous country, now we are not, but still this concept was poorly or differently developed. You cannot copy paste it from multicultural societies. A highly contested term, gender, which is by some politician in Poland called as gender ideology. Again, something that was brought from outside and we were trying to digest it. And for some reason, we were uh, in a way opposing it. And just to show it on an example, and I get back to my slides, uh, this is uh, a glimpse from my um, uh, research that was carried out quite a long time ago, uh, but it was about building the wonderful mosque on the right side. And I was analyzing the discourse about uh, of those who were against the mosque and there those who are in favor of the mosque. And uh, I tried to, 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 to uh, put the negative discourse and positive too into some categories. And interestingly, um, conscious Europeans, that is Polish people who were against the mosque, constituted a third of all mosque opposers. And this is what they say. Stop Islamization of Europe. Construction of a mosque in Poland is another step towards the slow Islamization of Europe. Let's learn from the mistakes of France, Germany, England. You, you, you can see it's France, Germany and England and not, you know, Bulgaria, Romania and Hungary. No to Islamization of Poland. We don't want what's happening in Britain, Germany, Sweden and France. Uh, in the same way, those who were in favor of the mosque, they were not referring to the local perspective. Like let's give local Muslims, you know, a space to pray. They were referring to Europe. Why we should not be the backwater of Europe. We should embrace multiculturalism. We are in the EU. We should be just like them. So as you can see, uh, something that was very local. And I would expect people to wonder, you know, if there are going to be enough parking spaces or if the muezzin is going, you know, to be loud or not so loud, became European. So these concepts work in a way that either we want to be included in the discussion and the dialogue in these ideas, or we are rebelling against. All the time, we are in the semi-peripheral, I would say, position to the uh, European Union. And actually, some people say that Poland needs, Thompson, I, was, I suppose, Poland needs this kind of uh, hegemonic leader to, 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 you know, to negotiate uh, its position. And as for the way of my concluding remarks, uh, on one hand, on the one side, I think that using the colonial perspective for Polish experience would make sense. Maybe we would be easier when it comes to some parts of our difficult history. We still have problems with discussing events that are against our collective memory, so to say. Uh, on the other hand, I think that if we get these words from outside, and this is how the colonization was applied to Poland, some people from outside, from Anglophone academia, discovered that this perspective applies to Central and Eastern Europe. Then it might not work because we might either rebel against or might not fit into. Uh, so maybe an indigenous perspective on the colonization would help to solve it, but I'm not sure. I'm just leaving it here. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. And I give the floor to the other speakers. Thank you very much. Uh to Katarzyna gurak sosnowska and I next I'm happy to give the floor to Irena Skokina. Irena, proszę. Thank you very much for, for this invitation. I'm happy to speak today and uh, thank you Katarzyna for such a concise presentation of situation in Poland. I think it's really very uh, deep and uh, my presentation will be of a different kind. Uh, I cannot speak uh, in uh, in such a, a generalizing uh, kind of uh, deep thinking at the moment. And I uh, would rather propose uh, one certain suggestion, uh, which is a, a vision of uh, my institution where I work, Center for Urban History, and some of our experiences in uh, dealing with this issue of uh, uh, in empire and colonialism in the case of historical research. Uh, so actually, uh, I would like to share with you uh, some of my 
uh, uh, some of my experiences. Uh, so uh, actually, um, uh, just before the uh, just before the um, uh, Corona uh, uh, started, uh, uh, we actually were engaged in um, in the project, uh, which was connected to um, uh, rethinking of uh, existing uh, historical source base uh, for uh, research of 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, which was mentioned in the introduction on archiving post industry. And I think uh, this um, is uh, quite an important uh, case of uh, how um, actually uh, we can think uh, deeper about uh, uh, decolonizing uh, not only uh, topics or curriculum or um, actually uh, 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 research questions, uh, but uh, what is more important, I think, uh, the colonizing of uh, um, the colonizing of um, uh, uh, source base and the colonizing actually what is uh, in the uh, as a ba exists as a basis for uh, our uh, our research and uh, communication. And uh, I think uh, rethinking of existing source base. Uh, should go through, uh, can go through um, such uh, tools as digital history and public history. And uh, of course, uh, this is a very uh, special uh, kind of suggestion, which uh, does, uh, does not or cannot really substitute probably the whole spectrum of uh, academic approaches. Mm, uh, but still, I think uh, um, that is something which is still uh, not so much present in the Ukrainian context. And uh, we would like, with our institution, we try to push forward uh, uh, more active use of this instrument, and especially not only for the uh, for like national history or history of uh, uh, relations between uh, Ukraine and uh, its uh, former empires, uh, or Ukraine as part of uh, like uh, uh, Ukraine and its uh, colonial experience, or. Uh, Ukrainian experience as a part of the imperial core, as a part of um, actually uh, mainland empire, which is also true. And I think here Polish case is quite similar because once again uh, we have here both experience of uh, domination and subjugation. Mm, uh, but I think also uh, perspective of uh, uh, relations between uh, different regions uh, of Ukraine, which is also needs uh, decolonization. And uh, the focus of uh, my research is uh, Donbass, uh, the industrial and post-industrial region in the east of Ukraine, uh, from where actually the war uh, with Russia started. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, I think um, uh, many scholars also paid attention at uh, uh, how Donbass also served as a kind of iconic case uh, of uh, black legend of uh, industrial um, regions and also iconic case of uh, civilizing mission of the empire on the edge, on the edges, uh, on the borderlands. And uh, actually, uh, I think uh, Donbass also shows very well how the ongoing canon of uh, uh, historical thinking in Ukraine is changing and also it shows that uh, this is not uh, enough uh, just to decolonize the canon and to change uh, one uh, set of uh, heroes in national history for other set of heroes mm, but of course what we need is a deeper thinking of uh, uh, our uh, prejudices and our approaches to uh, for example uh, other regions or other cultures, and uh, also, of course, um, uh, rethinking research procedures and hierarchies, and also institutional frameworks of knowledge production. And here I'm talking specifically about uh, how, uh, for example, uh, we, uh, as a center for urban history, which is uh, located in Lviv, in the west of Ukraine, how we uh, cooperated with uh, uh, several institutions in uh, Donbass and in, um, in the east uh, of Ukraine. And uh, finally, uh, I would like to pay attention to uh, how uh, important are not only uh, human dimensions of history, but also non-human. And uh, uh, one example of how we also tried to address uh, the ecological issues in uh, our project focused on industrial history. 
and uh, actually what I'm talking about, I think I can explain it more through this one particular picture. And uh, maybe as a moment of interaction, I would like to ask you to share your maybe first uh, emotions or reflections about this uh, photograph. Mm, so actually why I think uh, this uh, photograph is especially provoking and interesting because we uh, really miss any uh, context for it. So it was found on, on the reel uh, in the uh, abandoned house uh, in, uh, near Lysychansk uh, in Donbass, uh, in Donetsk region, in Luhansk region. So uh, actually we really miss any information about uh, who made it and, uh, and why and for what. Mm, and uh, maybe, I don't know, any one of you would like to, uh, I don't know, quickly react to what is happening there uh, on, on, on this uh, photograph. I don't know. I, for, 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 for me, it looks like something familiar. Uh, and why they are burning something, I have no idea. But it looks very familiar for me. So probably could also be Poland. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. It's great to hear that uh, yeah, as an anthropologist, you really have such an empathy for uh, for any subject you, you really interact in your research. Uh, yeah, so actually this uh, photograph became for me a start for a deeper self-reflection about how we as a team of researchers from the Center for Urban History and we were also supported in our project uh, uh, by the uh, international donors, House of Europe, and we cooperated also with the University of St. Andrews in the United Kingdom. Uh, how we, as a kind of uh, international research consortium, approached uh, the uh, uh, archives in the Donbass. So the idea was to digitize and to collect and to give the second life uh, to the um, uh, photography and uh, amateur film. Uh, mostly from the Soviet era, but also some from pre-Soviet era. And uh, uh, in this process, uh, uh, for example, photographs like this, uh, uh, we actually were uh, very much uh, provoked for discussion about what we see. And we actually uh, uh, discovered our own uh, very deep stereotypes and colonial lenses through which we are looking at this region. So here we can see uh, how uh, people are actually uh, cooking maybe or preparing for cooking a, a chicken uh, just in front of uh, some, I don't know, building or public building, maybe next to a park and uh, how people are just using a bonfire for, uh, you know, uh, cooking uh, uh, fresh meat and uh, uh, different uh, versions about what is going on in this photography uh, provoked the discussion between us as researchers. And we actually realized uh, to which extent uh, all this fits into this uh, typical stereotype of uh, uh, of the east, of the wild uh, fields uh, of uh, Donbass, where people are very strange, uh, very uh, kind of uh, uncivilized, and uh, they do very uh, strange things there. And uh, all this uh, kind of uh, age-long uh, 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 stereotypes and uh, and uh, uh, hierarchical approaches to um, uh, to uh, local culture, and I think also Andri Portno very well addressed it in in his article about Donbas as other. So uh, this othering of Donbas in uh, Ukrainian intellectual discourses is something which also is uh, very much typical also for us as a team of researchers. And actually, our cooperation with uh, uh, so this about this uh, institutional aspects of knowledge production, uh, they were also very important in our project. Uh, for example, Mariupol Local History Museum. So here you can see how it looks like now. So unfortunately, it was totally destroyed uh, by Russian bomb bombardments of the city. Um, but we actually uh, managed to uh, cooperate and to digitize a lot in 2020-2021. Uh, when our project took place. And uh, one of the uh, uh, problematic aspects of this cooperation actually was uh, the uh, uh, institutional inequalities, because we as a center for urban history are supported by private donors and also international grant. So we were in a privileged position to have a stable staff who is equipped uh, with digitizing and instruments for uh, uh, public presentation of uh, our digital archives, 
and we are uh, like free to share with everyone as the uh, people who are into this digital history. And on the other hand, uh, local museum in the region which lack any resources and uh, state funding and uh, actually, but they on the other hand uh, 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 actually have very valuable physical sources which we do not have. And uh, the course of this cooperation and uh, reflection about our power uh, inequalities in this process were very stimulating for our project. And I think actually the reflection about the very process of production of knowledge and production of uh, archival collections, which was a result and uh, uh, is very important part of this. And I think uh, uh, the several thousands of uh, photographs which we managed to digitize from this archive, this is unfortunately just a small part which survived Russian bombardment now only in this um, digital uh, format in our archive. And actually talking about uh, the colonization of the source base, so what do we have in this in this uh, digitized collection? So if, when we try to uh, create some archive which is alternative to uh, imperial or colonial perspectives, which is alternative to state-centered narratives of history, which is uh, very much something different from what we have uh, from a state archival uh, system and state archival infrastructure. Um, in fact, very often turns out to be uh, like very similar and reproducing the same uh, the same uh, canon. And for example, here in Mariupol, but also in Pokrovsk, uh, where we digitized, I think, around uh, 30,000 uh, uh, photographs, uh, it is uh, actually also very much um, official um, press photography from the Soviet period. And uh, in fact, uh, also private archives are not uh, very much uh, challenging the existing canon. But our solution for this was uh, going deeper into uh, cooperation with uh, not only with the owners, whom we very often interviewed and engaged into uh, collective um, uh, commenting on the sources. For example, we uh, organized um, uh, open for the public uh, uh, days of uh, uh, amateur cinema. Uh, and, uh, uh, for example, also uh, some other formats of interviewing of owners of uh, photographs and amateur films which we digitized. Mm, uh, but uh, we also uh, started collecting response uh, from people who um, actually reacted very uh, vividly to what we uh, put online as a digitized sources. And uh, we were very surprised uh, that uh, actually people who are the users of historical sources are also very actively interpret them in a diversity of ways. And uh, these uh, very official Soviet uh, lenses, uh, which are reproducing uh, kind of um, very colonial perspective to Donbass as a uh, place uh, which is uh, dominated uh, by uh, industrial heroism, industrial labor effort, and uh, uh, kind of friendship of the nation, uh, people actually were uh, commenting in a very diverse way, uh, uh, from a certain, uh, for example, uh, nostalgia is here to uh, very critical and ironical comments, uh, but also, uh, for example, discussion of uh, official Soviet photography, which was representing uh, industry very positively. Um, for example, people discussed it in, uh, in a way that they uh, uh, criticized, uh, for example, ecological aspects of industry and their uh, private experiences as very, very critical against uh, the uh, imperial decisions about uh, location of industry next to the sea in the city of Mariupol. And uh, 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 so for us also, uh, uh, it was very important to uh, see how people comment on uh, certain aspects of Soviet official photography, which turned out to be anti-Soviet, as for example, this photography, which represents uh, the icon, uh, the Orthodox icon, which is uh, present on the wall in the uh, house of uh, one shock worker from one of uh, Mariupol industrial enterprises. But also uh, people unexpectedly used uh, photographs, which we digitized, for example, for uh, debates about the urban development of Mariupol and the uh, preservation of its heritage. So uh, these depictions of um, uh, buildings in uh, Mariupol were uh, very important uh, even before the war. 
for this uh, reflection about the uh, built environment and the changes. Uh, so they were absolutely leading in a different direction uh, and uh, not uh, to this uh, discussion about uh, like good or bad uh, Soviet past or Soviet empire. And uh, just to uh, sum up, uh, uh, so um, uh, uh, I would like maybe to uh, share a couple of other examples of how we you know, how we actually uh, later um, uh, worked with this material. So of course, it is always good to say that we uh, try to uh, uh, that we try to uh, uh, give the voice to, to the audience or to uh, uh, cre uh, to create uh, more democratic participation of the audiences in our uh, uh, practices of research. But it is always important also to uh, propose uh, uh, like pro professional vision and uh, um, uh, kind of to be uh, present in this uh, interaction and to be an active voice in, uh, in this uh, working with the archives. Uh, of course, um, uh, we tried to co-create and uh, to to have this dialogue with our audiences in uh, in working with uh, archives and production and in interpretation. Um, but I also think that uh, such uh, such uh, experiences as, uh, for example, uh, exhibition on uh, uh, exhibition on uh, uh, ecological uh, ecological aspects uh, of uh, uh, Donbass region uh, is uh, another suggestion uh, where we can show how actually mm, mm, photography and in general uh, uh, practices of uh, documenting were very much embedded in uh, uh, very hierarchical thinking and how, uh, for example, uh, uh, imperial photography was used uh, to construct uh, uh, Donbass as a uh, civilizing mission of uh, uh, empire on the wild field, and uh, through this uh, critical perspective, which we uh, propose to people, uh, and of course, uh, our voice is also present, and we uh, do not uh, really uh, uh, try to take our hands off uh, of, of this process of uh, knowledge creation. And of course, I invite all of you to visit our uh, website, where you can find both uh, our rich collections and uh, uh, some of the results, uh, such as, for example, this exhibition uh, connected to ecological uh, history and uh, um, kind of non-human perspectives and uh, uh, how actually the nature uh, is also very much a subject of uh, historical development. Uh, also, you can actually see uh, this very rich uh, collections which we digitized uh, with uh, Donbass local institutions and uh, Mm, uh, also, I think what is important that uh, you can uh, have access to originals of these images uh, uh, only through uh, its uh, original uh, owners, uh, through this local institution. So we uh, uh, present the images, but we do not own them. And we always try to respect this um, uh, actually uh, uh, equal, uh, not only equal access uh, for the audience, but also the rights uh, of uh, of the people who produced or owned uh, these images. And uh, also, uh, of course, uh, we are very much open to any kinds of cooperation. As for example, in this project, we also cooperated with artists uh, who created um, uh, an, an exhibition of artworks uh, based on uh, digitized materials. And of course, uh, this process of uh, uh, decolonization is not uh, uh, kind of uh, so straightforward. And I think uh, today, when we are thinking, uh, when we are looking at what is going on in Ukraine, which is very uh, spectacular processes of rethinking the canon, uh, how, for example, the monuments are demolished and new monuments are erected, and how Ukraine is actively trying to uh, break uh, with the Russian imperial tradition. I think it is uh, most important also to critically look at uh, us as uh, Ukrainians or Ukrainian researchers or researchers of Ukrainian topics and to which extent we are also uh, guilty or maybe somehow engaged in uh, reproducing certain uh, hierarchies and, uh, and uh, uh, imperial approaches and to which extent uh, we can uh, work uh, in uh, uh, kind of uh, also applying this uh, 
post-colonial critique to ourselves and uh, relations between Ukrainian regions, between different institutions, uh, between people with uh, different statuses in the academia. So I think this process then uh, will be uh, much, much deeper. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for your very, very uh, thoughtful and stimulating remarks. Uh, so that was Irina Skolkina. And now uh, I'm glad to give word to our third speaker today, Batakos Kasambekova. Batakos, please go ahead. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very honored uh, to be here. I would like to start <clears throat> my um, uh, uh, contribution with um, um, a big um, acknowledgement and gratitude uh, to the people of Ukraine uh, who are resisting current uh, colonial war um, against uh, 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 the country and which has spurred um, an unstoppable political process of decolonization. And that process is um, something that um, we, we will just need to um, embrace. Um, and it's something that uh, we will not be able uh, to avoid um, anymore. And the questions of uh, colonialism for the uh, region of um, East European uh, uh, history um, and um, especially Soviet history. I think uh, the current political events are raising a lot of questions, not only about colonialism, but about resilience uh, also to colonialism and really inspires um, a very important uh, conversation about positionalities, about um, you know, culture being a resource um, of resistance, about um, um big questions uh of um you know dictatorship and democracy um so uh the topic of today's discussion is um kind of uh academia outside of um anglo uh anglo-american uh probably academia but for me this was um i've been thinking a lot about uh positioning myself and uh, i think it is an impossible task really for me i come originally from uh, kazakhstan i spent my formative uh, university years in kyrgyzstan in bishkek i've spent um, a lot of uh, time in archives and research and living in tajikistan but i also studied in uh, great britain and germany and i'm currently in um, uh, switzerland i've been drawn to uh, german-speaking academia because of the debates about dictatorship and violence and i um, thought that the, this was a very useful lens for me to study the past so I, I'm not uh, a scholar of decolonial thought and decolonial thinking, but um, uh, but I'm a historian. And the, the reason I became a historian, I didn't study history in bachelor's because uh, there was no uh, history department at the university where I studied. Uh, so I studied political scientists and uh, social anthropology. But uh, uh, once uh, my father visited me and he told me about the, um, uh, the uprisings that he witnessed um, in um in uh, Bishkek what was Frunze in 1967 and um I learned that uh, uh, uh that the biggest post-Stalinist uprisings actually took place in uh, Central Asia they were brutally suppressed uh with tanks and army uh, these were very bloody and difficult to suppress uprisings and uh that was um very interesting because nobody uh, knew about these uprisings actually in Kyrgyzstan also people did not know about this uprising so uh, there was a uh, difficulty even with oral history because a lot of people learned to forget actually um, it was so dangerous to talk about these uprisings afterwards um, that uh, it actually uh, was erased even from public uh, memory and even when I found people who were ready to talk about it uh, they they were very nervous uh, actually talking about um, these surprisings. So for me, I decided to become a historian uh, after I've learned about it because I realized that um, we simply don't know a lot of the things. And so this kind of erasure became a very important uh, uh, topic for me. And uh, for me, um, now I, uh, one can probably uh, frame it as a decolonial practice. For me, it's a really boring um, 
mission to um, look into the past and to find out things that we've learned to forget, that we don't know uh, what was um, what was uh, uh, actually taking place uh, during the Soviet period. Um, and so I've uh, spent a lot of times, uh, a lot of uh, 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 months and actually several years uh, uh, sitting in archives in, uh, in Moscow, in Dushanbe, in Khujand, in Tashkent, um, in Bishkek as well, um, studying uh, uh, the Soviet past. Mm. And for me, um, taking uh, my inspiration from kind of German debates about dictatorships, um, for me, uh, there was no um, also decolonial agenda in my um, education. So I was really studying violence and I was really studying uh, practices of rule that led to violence and violence as a means of kind of political um, uh, 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 control. Um, but when I, um, so I didn't come uh, to research with kind of some uh, decolonial agenda, but then you cannot ignore it. Um, it comes to you um, because this is what archives tell you. So for me, when I, uh, um, you know, read things about uh, colonialism, post-colonial studies, I always understood decolonial approach as simply critical humanist approach. And it was, it is part of a larger humanist kind of enlightenment project um, to critically analyze the past. Um, it is, um, for me, was always in the kind of, um, um, in the uh, larger kind of uh, project of, um, um, you know, critically and reflectively analyzing the way we study um, um, uh, uh, the past, uh, learning more about uh, the past, critically analyzing the narratives, and kind of um, uh, uh, looking at how the narratives and uh, different realities uh, coexist together. Um, and so because colonialism was such an important part of the you know, 19th century and century, uh, colonialism produced not only hierarchies, inequalities, inequalities, violence, but also shaped ideas, frameworks for understanding and speaking about the world. And so um, colonial relations constructed the world, uh, including the Soviet world, um, just as did um, anti-colonial resistance. Um, so for me, studying actually imperialism and colonialism uh, was simply kind of uh, something that uh, that is open uh, to everyone. And in my kind of um, biography and my kind of career as a historian, um, I didn't have big problems finding the common ground with scholars from all over the world. And so it's not... Uh, simply, um, you know, um, studying uh, colonialism or critiquing, um, uh, critically analyzing uh, certain tools of colonialism wasn't something that is prerogative only for the people who experience colonialism. It's really um, was irrespective of gender, irrespective of age, irrespective of geography. So positionality, in my experience, was really political. People who saw things and people who did not see things. So people who saw kind of the cynical um, understanding of the friendship of people and people who did not see. So, and it's, and it's really not um, about uh, uh, um, uh, geography. It's really about uh, the ethics and uh, uh, um, one's, um, uh, one's understanding of, um, you know, uh, 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 kind of putting justice and uh, human dignity and human rights into the kind of uh, center of research. Um, so, um, but at the same time, uh, once I kind of had more material to present um, uh, my presentation, I've had a lot of um, experience um, so at the same time, I cannot uh, put myself uh, and say that I'm this or that scholar, but from th another side, when I did present, um, there was a lot of resistance uh, to what I uh, presented because uh, there was a lot of resistance to understand the Soviet past 
as imperial or as colonial past. And that was a wake up call for me. And I couldn't understand it because I uh, thought that we are kind of all together in our um, humanist um, 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 knowledge, uh, 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 humanist research and humanist um, understanding of the past. And so for me, um, I, it, it took me a long time to understand, uh, or probably I don't understand it until now, uh, to understand uh, why is it that there is a lot of backlash um, uh, uh, of uh, understanding the Soviet past as a, um, as a colonial experience. Um, and I also, uh, when um, last year, I mean, Acho Kobaiba from Nazarbayev University and I published an article where we critically analyze the concept of modernity, modernization and development for understanding the Soviet past, um, there was some backlash to that. And, that and, and for me, it was also very interesting. So, um, and then somehow without kind of uh, me uh, thinking about it a, lo a lot, um, uh, I received uh, many different emails and uh, 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 feedback um, accusing in kind of becoming a decolonial scholar. Um, and uh, so some of the narratives I found extremely interesting um, in different kind of these accusations. So first one, is uh, do you want to be a self-victimizing scholar now? And so for me, it was very interesting because I really realized uh, with this initial kind of research about uprisings of 1967, is that it is really empowering to learn more about the past. It is really empowering to learn more about the kind of violent structures and the history of violence, because um, it tells us a lot of the things, it explains it explained to me, uh, for example, my grandparents, it explained to me my parents, it explained a lot of the fears and a lot of the problems that I carry in my biography. So um, there was another kind of accusation and there was another kind of uh, narrative is that uh, uh, when one's, uh, you know, uh, researches and talks about colonialism, uh, that there is a tendency for scholars um, to go native or to be nativist or to search for authenticity. And it is very interesting because um, uh, cultural erasure was a very important part of the Soviet past and Russification, as we know. So, um, and this topic of cultural erasure and um, being kind of uh, uh, accusation of, um, uh, of uh, trying to be nativist, trying to be ethnographic or folkloristic really works well with the kind of understanding of the um, uh, of how the Soviet uh, nationality politics worked through kind of this uh, also presenting people as nativist. Um, but deconstructing kind of this uh, folkloristic uh, approach during the Soviet times is also uh, seen as uh, nativist. So for me, um, mm, it's not, I mean, for me personally, it's not uh, um, something that I, how I would understand decolonization, but I found this kind of narrative and this accusation of coming to these kind of pure roots um, as being very problematic. Uh, another um, uh, um, accusation that I found extremely interesting um, is the accusation in, um, um, uh, canceling kind of research that has been conducted so far. And this is not an, kind of this uh, moral panic about people studying and critically analyzing colonial relationships um, and thinking that uh, 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 somebody will cancel somebody. Um, I found it very interesting. And it's not, um, it's not very helpful in our kind of uh, uh, understanding uh, of the past. And I speak here now as a historian. Um, so, and another accusation that I found extremely interesting that was um, in the uh, past several years uh, that I heard towards myself is um, really Americanization, that uh, the colonial approach actually, that is something that is an American thing. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, I was, uh, or Westernization, and that is very interesting because it came also from scholars 
um, who allocated, um, well, both in Western and um, uh, in uh, different parts of the world. And that is very interesting because I found it also kind of a very, um, um, so it, in a way it also um, reflected kind of this Soviet cosmopolitan, like uh, accusation in cosmopolitanism. And also for me, it was an idea that again, connected to this idea that uh, there are these um, uh, local scholars who somehow um, have uh, the, um, um, mm, resentment um uh and and so uh, people like me where we don't belong to the west but we also are not local scholars um uh so i found it also very interesting and i see a lot of kind of continuity of how these um uh narratives uh are also present in kind of the Soviet, uh, in the Soviet narratives uh, uh, against, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I think I'm uh, um, uh, um, in the, um, that we see in kind of the construction of the Soviet Union. Um, I'm over the time, Vitaly. We, we should probably wrap up soon, yeah. but uh, you have said many very, very important things, so I would not be rushing to cut you off. Um, um, so let me let me stop here and then I will just um, um, uh, uh, speak. Um, I will um, answer the questions and uh, respond to your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, but of course, thank you again to all three of our presenters for uh, providing us a really multidimensional and thought-provoking setup uh, as we have had a perspective of uh, the contemporary socio-political situation. We have had uh, the perspective of uh, working with source bases and um, archives and documents and how it's the structuring of those institutions, the, you know, the archives, the museums, uh, how they also sh shape our knowledge and how this is also transforming now in the decolonial, in the context of thinking about and trying to act, uh, uh, enact decolonization, especially right now in Ukraine in the context of war and really wonderful, the you know, thought provoking uh, reflections uh, from uh, Batakos about different, uh, the politics of academia and the structures and the setup between different parts of the world, between different kinds of engagement, in different kinds of understanding of how one practices respons ethically responsible scholarship. And indeed, uh, the uh, backlashes that have uh, uh, ensued uh, often in uh, the study of uh, Eastern Europe and Eurasia and the former Soviet empire and its former satellites. And we see those backlashes uh, play uh, uh, around us and spilling out into social media and even coverage in mainstream media. Um, that is something that, you know, we've had to deal with quite a bit now. Uh, so I hope we have a good, uh, robust discussion. We already have a number of questions in the Q&A, so I will uh, look at those questions now. I mean, I've already looked at some of them, so I will uh, direct them. Some of them are to specific panelists. Some of them are for the panel as a whole. So uh, the first question is uh, for Katarzyna uh, from Yadiga McKay. Um, and it has to do with the two competing uh, visions of Poland when it, Poland regained independence after World War I, Piłsudski's Poland for all and Dmowski's uh, Poland for Poles. Uh, how does this, uh, those um, division, how does it impact uh, the sense we have now of multiculturalism in Poland? 
Oh, uh, well, it impacts definitely how we are um, talking about recent uh, about our recent history. Well, the mosque is a bit contested by those who are into multiculturalism, but the problem is that whatever we take from the well past. I mean, not the recent past, but the past that was previously, does not necessarily fit into contemporary multiculturalism as we see it from the West, so to say. Uh, so um, our idea of multiculturalism that we have in Poland is more, in a way, a borderland multiculturalism. And we are, you know, familiar with Germans living next to us, uh, Czechs, Russians to uh, Ukrainians, and this is familiar, this is homey, this is what we understand. The problem starts if there are migrants coming from Asian, African countries. This is something that, well, in a way, we have still problem with dealing with. And that's why I think that these two kinds of multiculturalism are in a way separate. We try to compensate the lack of your multiculturalism by linking it to the borderland type, but still they are two different stories, I would say. And this is again the problem of the clashing perspective and with us willing to fit in. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for Irina Sklokina from Olga Verakhovskaya. And uh, the question is about uh, decolonization work practices by Ukrainian professional archivists? Uh, are there efforts to remediate description and cataloging of uh, funds held by the archives? Do you see a possibility for collaboration between your institution with uh, professional archivists? Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much. I think it's a great uh, question, of course, and uh, a big uh, kind of uh, literature already about, uh, in general, how we can decolonize archive as such. And I think, uh, um, uh, of course, this is a process uh, which has no end, so you always can really struggle with this. But uh, overall, uh, I think that still, uh, like, state uh, Ukrainian archives are very much based on this uh, very kind of exploitative uh, logic of empire, which is uh, structuring through branches of industry and agriculture, so certain kind of exploitative and extracting approach to a territory, right? So you have uh, like uh, uh, divisions uh, for different branches of industry and development, so it's very much uh, kind of modernist uh, approach and uh, utopian vision of the future as a uh, bigger and bigger exploitation of uh, land uh, resources uh, for some uh, future progress. And uh, also, of course, uh, in terms of language and formulation, um, uh, uh, this is very problematic to really change, uh, uh, for example, just to change the descriptions. Uh, it uh, does not automatically lead to um, kind of rethinking or restructuring. And, uh, uh, actually, from 1990s, uh, most of Ukrainian archives uh, and also later in later decades, uh, they translated, uh, uh, and I think this is a big uh, already step in the colonization, the translation from uh, uh, Russian to Ukrainian. And uh, in this process, very often they also changed uh, some notions. Uh, for example, they changed, uh, I don't know, civil uh, war uh, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, 1917, uh, 1921. To uh, Ukrainian national uh, like struggle or Ukrainian uh, national Re liberation revolution from uh, 1917 to 1921, but it does not uh, really change your approach. It only changes uh, like uh, the uh, the uh, uh, good and bad, and they uh, rather changed uh, the canon in a way that to uh, kind of uh, deconstruct uh, what was existing, but reproducing the same hierarchical approach. And I think, uh, of course, there are some super great projects, uh, for example, a number of archival, archival uh, 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 how you call it, uh, a number of um, uh, archival uh, uh, node, uh, archival, uh, uh, boy, how you, uh, how you call, uh, uh, books uh, uh, which are dedicated to uh, like Surungen, yeah. So uh, 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 um, uh, actually, uh, 
uh, a number of uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, publications dedicated to uh, uh, looking for certain types of materials in Ukrainian archives were published, such as, for example, uh, um, introduction to Jewish sources in different Ukrainian archives. And this is already a very huge international cooperation when you take a certain group, which was earlier underprivileged, underrepresented, and also hidden in the archives, very much silent in the sources, and then you try to uh, take it to the light, and you take to make it central, and you publish even uh, different uh, books about uh, where and how you can find uh, Jews in in Ukrainian archives. Uh, so this is a really great, uh, great case of uh, decolonization, I think. Uh, but most often, uh, I think what is going on is the creation of alternative archives. And I think especially now with this ongoing war and ongoing full-scale invasion of Russia, this process is uh, very, very much obvious that so many people really use archiving and collection in a certain, I don't know, practice of preserving human dignity and uh, human agency in the face of uh, really this destructive and very powerful process of destruction. And uh, so many people, both uh, on the territories which are directly affected uh, by the bombing and uh, shell bombings and uh, uh, on the occupied territories, so people really uh, document. Uh, they document atrocities, they document everyday life, uh, they uh, collect uh, different items. And sometimes uh, they even, for example, uh, continue collecting um, uh, documents and testimonies, for example, from the Second World War. And uh, I also know several initiatives uh, uh, which are really showing that still collecting uh, the documents and uh, testimonies uh, from other wars, from other historical periods, and especially from the Second World War, is very much relevant for the ongoing situation. And actually, our institution also is engaged in documenting the ongoing war, and we have uh, oral testimonies of displaced people. Uh, also, uh, we uh, archive or we uh, uh, preserve uh, um, uh, uh, several thousand uh, 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 social network channels, such as Telegram and uh, other channels. Uh, and also, we collect uh, uh, dreams, uh, so how people dream during the war time, which is also a special uh, historical source. Also, diaries and uh, photographs. So we cooperate with uh, uh, like photographers in different regions of Ukraine who uh, document the ongoing changes for us. So I think that's uh, actually how the situation looks like. So you still have this uh, quite a rigid uh, uh, state system of archives, but you also have a lot of cooperations and also you have uh, like alternative from uh, online archives and private archives and uh, like very, very wide uh, uh, process uh, uh, where uh, private people uh, participate. Thank you so much, Irina. Uh, uh, next question is uh, was addressed to Katarzyna, but I think it could be a question to the whole panel, actually. And this is the relationship uh, between uh, the concept of race and the way the concept of race uh, typically is applied in Western, especially Anglophone academia, versus uh, the way uh, we apply decolonization in the post-communist uh, world's cases, whether a race as an axis of category, you know, categorical thinking is uh, as central there or is actually the mismatch or you know misunderstanding is creating the problems that we can see in terms of how we engage with uh, decolonial discourse and decolonial black practices maybe so maybe i will just briefly start um this is again another tricky concept uh, because if you again take a look at Polish perspective, probably some other centralist European perspectives. There are even some people who claim that we don't have a problem or issue with race because there are no people of different races in our countries. This is, uh, I would say, uh, tackling the issue on a very surface level. This is not how it really is. Uh, and this also makes the, the, the issue again challenging. Uh, so I would say that for Poland, uh, well, we have this Polish centrism, uh, Bolaji Balabun, 
coins the concept, that the race is so very much internal to ourselves that we don't even see that we, we, we actually belong to certain race because basically we, we, we are very homogeneous. Now, at the same time, so maybe the, the, the race uh, issue could be again reformulated in a way interpreted so that it again fits our um, uh, our uh, research or our reality. Uh, as you have uh, mentioned, Vitaly, while presenting me, I have just recently engaged with racialization of Polish converts to Islam. I, it was very tricky because Polish scholarship is basically lacking or we tackle racism as something external that happens in the West. At the same time, I know that I have to critically engage with global literature and I have to, in a way, come to a dialogue between the Western perspective and what I want to present. This is a challenge. And there is one more dimension. There is past, well, growing number of articles about racialization of Central, Central and Eastern Europeans who work as economic migrants in the West, in the UK in particular. So again, there is a huge space to play with the concept, but not copy pasting it, as it is because it, it would again, at least I think, not make much sense. Uh, but of course, would you like perhaps to add something on this topic? Well, uh, race as a, a, a category of analysis is um, uh, was very important um, uh, uh, in my study. For example, I'll just give one um, uh, uh, um, example of um, a closed um, mining town in uh, Kyrgyzstan uh, where um, I did my research. So the uh, so um, in um, a piece that is coming out soon that I co-authored with Aminacho Kabaiva, where we propose to look at the Soviet uh, history through the settler colonial perspective. Uh, we'll look at these, for example, closed uh, cities as, uh, uh, you know, uh, important places of settler colonialism. And so when I, you know, studied it uh, uh, a number of years ago, uh, the city was spatially divided into Bombay and Shanghai. And uh, so when I asked people, so what is Bombay and Shanghai, they would tell me, oh, Bombay is there where the white people lived. Uh, so it's for the white people and Shanghai is for the rest. So uh, uh, the Shanghai part of the town was first settled by uh, 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 deported Chechens and English people. And then it was very multi-ethnic. Um, a lot of uh, deported people uh, live there. So this kind of racialization, even of space, you know, the cities being for the white people, the cities being for the Russian people. Um, or if you if you move to the city, Russification was really understood as whitening also for Kazakh people. And so kind of a lot of the um, kind of race, uh, the way um, it lived, uh, for example, teachers would say Kazakhs who speak Russian, be get European uh, features, kind of, they become racially different. There is kind of this racial transgression. So a lot of uh, the colonial discourse and practices, starting from spatial practices, living practices, who, how lives, I live as a white person. So this kind of, there is a lot of um, uh, ways of kind of the proper uh, 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 colonial uh, way of living, but also language and even bodies were very much racialized and were key for narrating the Soviet regime. Thank you. And, uh, but of course, the next question is also for you. Uh, uh, the question is uh, from Shoshana Keller, and I'm sorry I uh, did not name uh, the previous questioners. Uh, the question about race was from Svetlana Yaroshinska. Uh, so do, uh, did you hear the bigger backlash from people from the former USSR or from people from other parts of the world? Are former Soviet citizens also wrestling with renegotiating their own identities as they think about decolonization? Uh, thank you, Shoshana. Uh, uh, nice uh, to hear from you. Um, yes, I mean, uh, uh, it's, um, 
I think a lot of backlash uh, came from um, uh, not so far from Central Asia, but other parts uh, of the Soviet Union, especially uh, the metropolitan regions uh, of the Soviet Union, I would say uh, Russia. Um, so from uh, scholars from Russia, there was a lot of um, um, backlash, uh, accusation in ingratitude for the Soviet past, uh, for the upbringing. Um, and also from scholars in Western institutions, and also a lot of the accusations in ingratitude. So, um, yeah, doing these things is a lot of, uh, it requires also a lot of kind of resilience and emotional work. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Craig Campbell, and it's for the entire panel. Uh, the specter of Western bias, quote unquote, in scholarship has haunted my own research and I've struggled to talk about histories of socialist colonialism with colleagues in Russia. I'm grateful to hear these conversations from all of you. Uh, for cultural history of the Soviet Union, it seems to be an effort to challenge the myth of the Druzhba Narod, of friendship of nations, but surely that is only one part. Where have you seen critical arguments find traction? So I guess the, uh, to reformulate it is uh, in the cultural history of the Soviet Union, uh, beyond a critical engagement with the friendship of people's myth, uh, what are other ways in which we can critically engage with using you know, decolonial approaches? Yeah, thank you so much. I think this is really a great uh, question. And I think uh, that economic history and social history could be one of the very fruitful fields. And I think that uh, that is very challenging on the other hand, because really it's uh, mm, uh, very much impacted by uh, perestroika years when we, uh, when people actually experienced a certain uh, very powerful uh, discourse about the relations between republics and uh, and the center, and uh, uh, very much we uh, we are looking, for example, at Brezhnev period for the lenses of later period of perestroika. And uh, I think uh, this uh, very solid, uh, like economical research, is very much needed, uh, for example. And also, I think uh, uh, also research on uh, uh, languages uses in the everyday life. And here I would like to relate to the previous question about the race. Uh, so I think, for example, Ukrainian literary studies, so they very much like uh, the concept of language as a race, right? So you should not have a different uh, color of your skin, but you can uh, just uh, express your race or you can become uh, a subjugated uh, subject uh, because of your language and how, how you pronounce and how you speak. Uh, so uh, this is, I think, also a very much understudied field. And also, I think, um, uh, direction which I especially admire is uh, uh, infrastructure history, history of, uh, for example, professional um, uh, uh, professional uh, groups uh, in the Soviet Union. If we are looking uh, not only at uh, for, like authorities or people of the highest uh, ruling class, and we do not look at uh, kind of um, uh, people who are uh, like. Uh, everyday uh, or ordinary kind of uh, Soviets as uh, um, as uh, it was the case in uh, uh, in uh, I think uh, uh, previous decades of uh, Soviet studies but if we uh, try to look for example at uh, uh, professional groups of uh, architects uh, cultural heritage preservists uh, um, urbanists uh, uh, people um, uh, from uh, who work in museums right so people in uh, in uh, in the cultural production, uh, that would be super interesting to look at uh, exchanges and circulation of ideas, and also circulation of people in the Soviet Union and processes of social advancement and uh, uh, processes of uh, kind of uh, interaction between perceptions and uh, um, uh, perceptions of people in terms of. Uh, uh, future careers and uh, uh, practical uh, decisions and uh, structures of uh, uh, decision making, uh, uh, where and who will work and uh, how, uh, for example, mobilized professionals from Ukraine will later um, uh, lead this uh, colonial mission somewhere in 
Turkmenistan or Tajikistan. And I think, uh, for example, research about oil industry is one of the great cases. So Alexander Eskin, uh, who tried to look at how um, uh, professionals of oil industry uh, from uh, Prekarpatia, from Western Ukraine, actually were those who led uh, the colonial exploitation of Siberia in the 70s and 80s. And these were the people who actually uh, built uh, this uh, whole big uh, uh, Soviet uh, oil empire. So that, uh, I think, is um, uh, quite an interesting suggestion. So when we uh, try to use uh, uh, different angles, not only uh, like uh, direct reflection about um, culture and propaganda, but of course, economic history and uh, history of infrastructures and history of professionals and professional classes. Yeah, yes, um, probably I could add, add also environmental history, I think is very important. As you know, um, uh, most of the um, um, nuclear um, arsenal was tested in Kazakhstan, uh, also where people did not know that there was testing. Uh, 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 um, uh, Dr. Tarjanova wrote uh, uh, a wonderful book about it, but also um, uh, it, it's much more than that. The environmental consequences and the colonial way uh, um, uh, of that is very important. Also in my current research, social welfare. Um, uh, if you look at social welfare, which was um, not simply influenced by colonialism, but was also a very important tool uh, for uh, Soviet settler colonialism. Um, uh, so social welfare, um, I, I cannot think of... Um, of an area where it is not, <laughs> where you cannot, uh, uh, so one really needs to ask, um, how can I look at it through the colonial lens? And then if one really starts thinking about it, it, it becomes a very eye-opening experience. And one really starts, I mean, this is not how I came to the field. I didn't have this agenda. But then once you look at things, um, they, they simply stop, uh, start uh, popping up. The thing is that if one simply looks in uh, for Moscow only, and if one looks at, for example, Kazakhstan, but doesn't know Kazakh and studies only through the lens of Moscow and only through the Russian, Russian language, then it might be more difficult. It's not impossible, but it, it is, it, it is uh, uh, quite difficult, yes. Yes, this is something that, you know, I think we have all experienced like a certain resistance to, you know, that this is an approach that somehow sullied uh, certain people's sort of utopian vision of what the Soviet project may have represented to them. So uh, the challenge of reconciling, you know, the of being an implicated subject and perhaps having some utopian views about world peace and justice and emancipation and nevertheless perpetuating um, colonialist approaches and biases and in how the, the Soviet project was structured. Um, lack of, you know, recognition of this kind of nuanced vision is that something that I too have encountered in some cases. Uh, but continuing uh, to, with our questions and comments, next one comes from Ep Anus, and Ep, good to have you in the audience, to Botakos, great presentation, uh, so greatly needed. I appreciated how you tied a colonial and anti-colonial together in saying that both colonial relations and anti-colonial resistance structure the world. And I also appreciated your remark, at least this is my interpretation, that many critiques of uh, post-colonial, decolonial approaches to Soviet rule actually in a way perpetuate Soviet era discourses. Do you see a way out? And why do you think we're still dealing with continuations of such discourses? Uh, thank you for this question. Um, and. Um, um, so in the book that I'm co-authoring with uh, Kimberly Vernon, uh, which is called Imperial Innocence, uh, we'll look at the concept of the Soviet project as the project of benevolence, um, as the uh, kind of um, um, manifest destiny uh, 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 project that is um, 
we look at how not only kind of the colonized is constructed, but also the colonizers. So decolonization is really an open um, uh, project to look at not only how colonialism worked, but how it became invisibilized. How did we learn not to notice colonialism? How did we learn, for example, um, my mother, you know, often told me, you know, we are the aborigines, you know, we were always the aborigines. But then if you talk about colonialism, she would not know where to start. So she would explain a lot of the things where it's like certainly very colonial, but at the same time, um, it's something that one didn't, um, didn't learn, you know, to reflect upon. So, and these practices and tools of invisibilization, um, um, I think is also part of that. I cannot, uh, uh, I think uh, the Soviet uh, uh, kind of the Soviet uh, uh, history became a sp space of projection for a lot of people who want to um, criticize capitalism, criticize Western colonialism. And for many, it became kind of a way of, um, of um, thinking that there was this alternative. Uh, and of course, um, it is very attractive. It is very attractive to have a nice story. Um, uh, and we are all longing for this story. But the price of telling this good story is the lies of our ancestors and the violence, the cruelty and hierarchies and, you know, exploitation. So um, I still believe that it is kind of um, uh, um, a project where we can where people from different backgrounds uh, can really, uh, um, you know, um, understand and uh, understand these violences. Uh, uh, one doesn't have to come from the Soviet Union or have this experience to understand that. I have experience of, uh, uh, um, you know, working with scholars uh, from different parts of the who who understand that. Um, so yes, this is uh, th this. We need to study kind of why, how exactly did we dislearn uh, to see violences? Uh, thank you so much, Patakos. We have time for one last question. Uh, and this comes from uh, Berat Talai. And the question is about the ghosts of the Soviet Union. And as for instance, in the physical infrastructure that is still standing, like the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan or the Palace of Culture and Science in Poland, how, what do they mean for the local population and uh, do how do we can perceive them? And if you have questions, I mean, comments, please comment quickly because I need to yield the floor back to Zhuzhana for uh, final remarks. So very briefly, uh, well, in Poland, we used to have some problems with the Palace of Culture and Science when we were getting um, away from uh, the USSR on the very beginning. Now it's just an ordinary building. So while there is a huge anti-Russian sentiment, especially now, uh, the building is not an issue and the physical infrastructure is not an issue anymore. It became in a way delinked from the past. It is now very contemporary and very real. All right, on this perhaps hopeful uh, note, uh, I would like to thank uh, the presenters again for today's very rich and thought-provoking and diverse and stimulating discussion. And uh, to give the floor back to Zhuzhana Magdo for housekeeping announcements. Thank you very much. Uh, by way of closing, uh, let me thank our speakers and members of the audience for joining us today. As a reminder, please consider attending our upcoming session next Friday, February 17th. That conversation will build on today's session by inviting emerging scholars to reflect on the state of the field, activism, and advocacy, and will be moderated by Jessica Pisano, Associate Professor at the New School for Social Research and at Eugene Lang College. Um, thank you again. Goodbye. Thanks so much, everyone, once again.